The prophet Zechariah was the son of Berechiah and the grandson of Iddo. The name of his grandfather was mentioned because there was a high probability that he was raised by his grandfather as his father died early before raising him, likely perishing in captivity. His name means the Lord remembers and his father's name means the Lord blesses. The significance of his grandfather's name in due time contributes to the hope of the first and second coming of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Prophet Zechariah not only brought a message of hope to the people of his time, but to all of humanity through the ages and even today. So in today's video, we will talk about the story of the Prophet Zechariah in Lucas Dario. Welcome to Witnessing Jesus Christ and Sin Overflowed Grace and there and there and there. My beloved, I ask for help from all of you to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell. If you enjoy the video, leave a like, as it greatly helps me produce more. Without further ado, let's get into the video. The dates mentioned in the book confirm that he was a contemporary of the prophet Haggai. Haggai had been preaching for two months and the construction of the temple had already begun when Zechariah started his work. Haggai's recorded ministry lasted about four months. Zechariah's prophecies cover about two years. While the prophecies in chapters 9 to 14 are undated, the main theme of Zechariah aligns with Haggai. Zechariah was called and sent by God to motivate the inhabitants of Jerusalem to complete the construction of the temple. They played a crucial role in awakening the elders and the people about Governor Zerubbabel and High Priest Joshua, urging them to finish the construction program. These were challenging times for the small Jewish community, facing continuous opposition from local Samaritans. The construction of the temple site resumed in 520 BC and was completed about four years later with the encouragement and help of God. Their determination and hard work finally paid off. The coming of the Messiah and Zechariah's prophecies include various references to the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. It speaks of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on a donkey. He was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and was pierced. Zechariah also describes the day of the Lord when Christ's feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, initiating his reign as the king of the kingdom of God on earth. Despite Judah being severely punished for its sins, God will not forget or abandon it. Eventually, the people of Judah will be remembered by God again, and Jerusalem will be a great, prosperous and peaceful city. This will be a time when all families of the earth will go there to worship Christ as the King, the Lord of hosts. Zechariah's message is truly filled with hope. The outline and structure of Zechariah and the book are organized into two parts. Chapters 1 to 8 speak about messages during the temple construction, and chapters 9 to 14 contain undated messages, probably after the temple construction. We will start with chapters 1 to 8. Zechariah chapter 1 verses 1 and 6 talk about the first message, a call to national repentance. Chapters 1 verses 7 and 8 discuss the second message, Zechariah's eight night visions. The first vision, the rider among the myrtles. Chapter 1 verses 7 to 17. The second vision, four horns and four skilled craftsmen. Chapter 1 verses 18 to 21. The third vision is a measurement of Jerusalem for future development, chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. The fourth vision is about Joshua, the accused high priest, speaking about the coming branch. In chapters 3, verses 1 to... The fifth vision, the golden lampstand and the two olive trees. In chapters 4, verses 1 to 14. The sixth vision, a flying scroll bringing a curse. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. The seventh vision, a basket carrying a woman, chapter 5, verses 5 to 11. And the eighth vision, four chariots and horses, chapter 6, verse 18. Commentators and many Bible scholars agree that the exact meaning of many of these visions is obscure and uncertain. 
Here's an important lesson. It is not wise to attribute our own personal meanings to these visions unless there is clear biblical support. For example, the fifth vision shows a lampstand producing light. Regarding the meaning of light, we understand that Christ came into the world as a light, and He is the light that illuminates the path of truth and understanding of life. Psalm 119 verse 105 states, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Christ referred to His disciples as light in a dark world, encouraging them to be bright examples for others. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In chapter 6, verses 9 to 15, it talks about a sequel of captives and about the branch that clearly refers to the Messiah who will build the temple of God. Today, we know that this time is us. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 8, talk about the third message addressing fasting and obedience. When the temple was almost completed, a delegation was sent to Jerusalem to inquire of the priests and prophets about certain national fasts, instituted as days of mourning for calamities. These were human traditions and did not refer to the fast proclaimed by God. On the Day of Atonement, as seen in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 26 to 32, Zechariah provided God's verdict in chapter 7 and 8 in four sessions. Each session begins with the same basic text. There is no condemnation of these national fasts, but God gives an important lesson on the purpose of fasting. The people were not fasting to draw near to God, but they were fasting for selfish reasons. While in captivity, the people should have used these fasting days as opportunities to reflect on the sins they committed, resulting in their national punishment. These fasts should have been moments of self-examination, leading to sincere repentance and a change in lifestyle. Instead, they were absorbed in feelings of self-pity and external remorse. The prophet questioned the benefit of their fasting in the past, as it was done out of habit and tradition. Christ also condemned hypocritical motives for fasting, and the issue of fasting was resolved. There is no indication that final decisions were made. However, Zechariah points to a time when national fasts will become joyful feasts. They paint a utopian scenario when Jesus Christ reigns. It will be an era of peace and prosperity, with young children playing in the streets of Jerusalem and older people sitting in the streets without fear. Consider the following description. In the conditions where Christ rules from Jerusalem, the inhabitants of one city will go to another. They will continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I will also go, yes, many peoples and strong nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and pray before the Lord. These verses describe a world without fear, poverty, disease and other social ills that afflict so many now. Chapters 9 to 14, the remaining 16 chapters contain a series of predictions speaking about the future history of God's people from that period to the end of the world, intertwined with many prophecies related to the person, character, and work of Jesus Christ. The proclamation of the gospel, the calling of the Gentiles, and the ultimate glory, which is the blessedness of God's church uniting Jews and Gentiles in a sacred community under their great supreme high priest and King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. The focus of the last six chapters is mainly on events related to the end times. In chapter 9, verses 1 to 8, it talks about judgment on neighboring nations. Chapter 9, verses 9 to 17, speaks about a prophecy of Christ riding into Jerusalem a few days before His suffering and death. However, these verses also refer to the second coming of Christ, when He will save His people and bring prosperity and peace to the entire world. Moving on to chapter 10, God has an accusation against the shepherds, possibly rulers or spiritual leaders, who failed to turn the people away from evil and sin. However, this situation will change with the second coming of Christ, a time when I will strengthen them in the Lord and they will walk up and down in His name. In chapter 11, God continues His accusations against the false shepherds who led the flock astray. 
During his ministry, Jesus Christ claimed to be the good shepherd, willing to give his life for the sheep. The hireling ceases to care for the flock and abandons them. A woe is pronounced against the useless shepherd in Zechariah, chapter 11, verse 17. In chapter 12, monumental and disastrous events are described as nations are engaged in a destructive battle around Jerusalem. When this battle occurs, probably a reference to the final culminating battle that will happen at Christ's return. The nations will be motivated to fight against Christ's return, but will be utterly defeated. Much of Zechariah 12 describes the scenes of battle and how God will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Note this remarkable statement in verse 10, And they will look upon me, whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. This is a clear reference to Jesus Christ, who was pierced in his first coming and will be seen in his return to earth. In chapter 13, the phrase in that day, in verse 1, shows a continuation of the flow of the story of events described in chapter 12. Christ will defeat his enemies and initiate the process of restoring true religion, starting with the cleansing and purification of the people from sin and impurity. The first chapter of the Most Hopi Fool and encouraging chapters of the Bible portrays Christ's intervention in human governments and affairs, depicting his return in power and glory, culminating in his millennial rule on earth. These inspiring millennium verses are touching, uplifting and exciting. As Zechariah's name suggests, God will remember his promises and we can be sure that he will not forget to fulfill them. Learn the lesson from the past, and the Apostle Peter warned that in the last days scoffers would come, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Indeed, these mockers are saying that we need not worry about the prophetic warnings of the Bible, as these claims are false, and Zechariah chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 describes a similar attitude among the people during the days of the prophet. The previous prophets died before their prophetic statements were fulfilled, and so they would reason that these prophecies were false and unreliable. Nevertheless, both Israel and later Judah went into national captivity exactly as God had predicted through his prophets. What some people forget is that God is alive and will ensure that his promises are fulfilled. This is a vital lesson that we must learn and remember. The death of Zechariah A.M. and the Bible mentions several Zechariahs, and many may confuse the Zechariah of Sioux Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 21, with the Zechariah mentioned by Jesus in Matthew, chapter 23, verse 35. Although both are named Zechariah, one is the son of the priest Jehoiada, and the other, differently, the Zechariah mentioned in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, must be the son of Berechiah, one of the minor prophets. And he is the most likely one because the other Zechariah, son of Jehoiada, died around 800 BC. If Christ had referred to this Zechariah, then the time elapsed from Abel to him would not cover the entire period of the Old Testament, which extended until 400 BC. From Abel to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, would be a much broader span of the Old Testament period than from Abel to Zechariah, son of Jehoiada. Since many Zechariahs are mentioned in the Old Testament, it is challenging to imagine that two of them had been killed in similar circumstances. What Jesus said about Zechariah being killed between the sanctuary and the altar and asserting that his contemporaries had responsibility for that death when using the expression, whom you murdered, all of this was fulfilled to the letter during the siege of Rome in Jerusalem around the year 70 AD and was reported by the historian Flavius Josephus. 
Also, in the end, those weary of shedding so much blood pretended to want to observe some form of justice, and having determined to kill Zechariah, son of Berechiah, because of his illustrious lineage, his virtue, his authority, his love for good men, thus allowed these sixty judges to pronounce sentence, there was not a single one of them who would not prefer to expose himself to death than to the remorse of having condemned a good man for the greatest of all injustices. All, with one voice, declared him innocent. And thus, Jerusalem, by making one more martyr, filled the measure of the sins of its ancestors. This is in accordance with Revelation 6 verse 11, which says, Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to rest a little longer, until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. And that was the video, my beloved. If you enjoyed this video, leave your like, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to activate the notification bell. God bless you all. Until the next video.